session of the conference. We're going to cover how scientists can be involved in campaigning and other political activities in the run-up to the 2020 election. Attorney Augusta Wilson is with us today to talk about such issues as whether scientists can donate to a candidate, volunteer for a campaign, and engage in other political activities. The goal is to ensure that researchers understand how to participate in politics to the fullest extent possible, while minimizing any negative repercussions on your professional lives. Um, she's going to talk about some limitations on political expression and involvement that might be relevant to you during campaign season, um, especially the Hatch Act. And she's going to talk about some First Amendment protections that scientists have uh, to that enable them to participate in political activism. So uh, I want to introduce Augusta Wilson. She's a staff attorney at the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. Uh, prior to that position, she held a fellowship at NYU Law School's Guarini Center on Environmental Energy and Land Use Law, where she researched and published on topics in energy and environmental law. She was also a staff attorney at the Clean Air Council, a nonprofit organization in Philadelphia where she focused on litigation involving pipelines, carrying natural gas, and fracking byproducts. Uh, before moving into environmental law, she was an associate at White & Case, working on pharmaceutical patent litigation. She's also been a federal clerk and um, got her JD from Cornell Law School. We're very grateful to Augusta for joining us today to um, share this really important information with members of the Science and Human Rights Coalition. Thank you, Augusta. Thank you so much. And hi, everybody. It's it's wonderful to be with you today. Um, and as Teresa just said, my name is Augusta, and I am with a group called the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. And I wanted to start out by just taking a very quick second to tell you all a little bit about um, CSLDF, <laughs> acronym for quite a long name. And um, we are a nonprofit organization that works to support scientists of all stripes, especially as our name indicates, uh, climate scientists, but all scientists uh, who are being harassed, attacked because of the work that they do. Um, so one of the first important things I wanted to make sure to say is that we offer um, completely free uh, and confidential consultations to scientists who have legal questions. So if you are such a scientist, please um, feel free to reach out to us, uh, whether it's a question related to the topics we're going to cover today or something else. Um, so today, uh, what we want to talk about is, you know, really um, stemming from the fact that scientists have, in the last few years in particular, been engaging in politics in ways that they really haven't before. Scientists as individuals, as well as scientific organizations and publications. Uh, you have up here on the slide just one quick example. Some of you may have seen that a few weeks ago, Scientific American gave its very first endorsement of a presidential candidate in its entire 175 year history. Um, just in a, one example of how uh, the scientific community has really been engaging in politics in new ways. There are record numbers of scientists running for office um, as individuals. And so scientists have a lot of questions, particularly as we are right at the very, very end of this general election season, um, which has been pretty consuming for a lot of people, about how they can um, participate in the political process and whether there are any restrictions that they need to be aware of um, as scientists on their political activity and how that activity uh, might affect their professional lives. And so that's what we're going to talk about a bit today. Um, the first really important topic uh, for scientists to be aware of who, who have these kinds of questions is uh, the Hatch Act. So that's where I'm going to start talking to you a bit about um, this piece of legislation. The Hatch Act is the primary federal statute that regulates the political activity of federal employees. 
Um, so as very much indicated there, it, it really does by its own terms apply to federal employees and not people who are not directly employed by the federal government. That said, um, if you are, for example, a scientist who has received a grant from the federal government or in one way or another interacts with the federal government as a contractor. Um, so you're not a direct employee, but you have relationships with federal agencies. Um, don't tune out here um, because there definitely are circumstances where, for example, a grant may have terms that require the recipient to abide by Hatch Act requirements or that incorporate Hatch Act-like requirements. So the principles that I'm about to talk through and, and the basic way that it works can actually be um, relevant for folks who are not directly employed by the federal government in some circumstances. Um, so the most important thing for scientists to understand, I know that hearing the Hatch Act, um, especially for those who are in the federal government and who have um, heard about it, can really trigger some anxiety. But the most important thing to understand is that the Hatch Act is designed to fundamentally affirm the rights of federal employees to engage in the political process as private citizens in their personal time. So who needs to be concerned with Hatch Act restrictions? And specifically, um, how does it work? How does, how does the Hatch Act break down um, different kinds of federal employees, um, in our case, different kinds of scientists who might be covered by it? Um, it has generally been construed to break employees into two basic groups. Um, one is called further restricted employees, and the other is called less restricted employees. Um, so further restricted, uh, there's a lot of detail in the act itself, and, and this is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably emphasize a couple times, we're doing a little bit of a 10,000 foot view here. Um, there's a bit of nuance here and some specific details in the statute itself, but generally speaking, um, further restricted employees are most often um, people who work in the national security arena, people who are involved in law enforcement. Um, and generally speaking, those who are career appointees in the senior executive service also are going to be considered further restricted employees. And I'm gonna talk in a minute in a, in a bit more detail about um, what that, you know, what it means to be further restricted. But um, for the moment, that's, that's an overview of who may be contained within that category. It's fairly circumscribed. It's not a huge number of people. Who is a less restricted employee? It is literally every other employee. Anybody who is not specifically a further restricted employee falls into the category of less restricted. So if you are a less restricted employee, if you are one of the probably pretty large majority of people who fall into the less restricted category, then the most important takeaway is that you can um, engage in a really pretty broad range of political activity uh, as long as you are not exercising federal authority when you do it. So what do I mean by that? Um, some examples. So less restricted employees are in their own personal time um, when they are not at work and when they are not exercising federal authority and they are not being paid by the federal government for, um, for their work at that time um, can, for example, volunteer with the campaign, get, you know, get involved with the campaign of a political candidate who's, who's running for office, um, attend a rally, even uh, give a political speech for that candidate at the rally and say, I support this candidate or give a speech saying I oppose this candidate as long as they are doing that um, on their own time and as a private citizen. And so, there are a couple of 
particular restrictions that it's important to be aware of, um, a couple small quirks, one of which is that less restricted employees, while they certainly can um, get involved with the political process, with partisan campaigns and, and groups, they are not permitted under the Hatch Act to fundraise for political candidates. And when I say that, I, I don't mean they are not permitted to, for example, make a donation out of their own personal funds to a candidate. I mean, for example, they are not permitted to host a fundraiser or solicit donations on behalf of the candidate. Uh, so it has a fairly particular meaning. And they also are less restricted employees are not permitted under the Hatch Act to themselves run for office in a partisan election. Um, so those are some of the really important contours for less restricted employees. Further restricted employees, that, that much more circumscribed group of, of folks, are subject to all the restrictions that less restricted employees are and also to a whole bunch of others. And, you know, again, as I said, this is sort of 10,000 foot view and there's some amount of detail in the act that we're not gonna have time to get into here. There's quite a, quite a list of very specific restrictions, but to give you an example of a few um, that, I, that I find sort of the most interesting and the most quirky. Um, so further restricted employees are, unlike less restricted employees, not allowed um, to participate in partisan political campaigns. So as I was describing, you know, a less restricted employee on their own time can certainly go get involved in, you know, in working with a campaign um, to a large degree. There are restrictions, much, much more significant restrictions on the ability of further restricted employees to engage in that kind of activity. Further restricted employees also are not allowed to act as poll workers and they are not allowed to drive voters to the polls. Um, again, just sort of a couple, you know, quirky little things that it's good to be aware of. If you are a scientist who is wondering, um, I'm not sure if I'm a less restricted or further restricted employee, that is exactly the kind of question that we at CSLDF would be very happy to talk through with you, uh, please feel free to reach out and, and we'll be happy to discuss. Um, I wanted to mention, so I've used the word partisan a couple of times and the Hatch Act is generally aimed at restricting or governing partisan political activity. And the specific meaning there is activity that is associated with a political party, um, a specific political party. Uh, so there is plenty of political activity that is actually not partisan. Um, and the Hatch Act does not prohibit that kind of activity. Um, so for example, um, a, a, some, an employee who is governed by the Hatch Act could run for the local school board um, in, a, in a capacity not associated with any particular political party. And that would be political activity that wouldn't trigger Hatch Act concerns uh, at all. Um, the same thing could easily go for someone who wants to get involved in supporting or opposing a constitutional amendment or a proposed municipal ordinance. So, I've just said a whole bunch of words. Um, sometimes one of the easiest ways to understand how something like this works is to take a couple of real world examples and, and, and work through them. So I thought that it would be great to take a couple of minutes to, to do that. Um, and lucky for us, the Hatch Act has been in the news uh, some amount lately, so it's not too hard to find examples. Um, many of you may recognize uh, Kellyanne Conway, who is pictured here. Um, Kellyanne Conway, until recently, was a pretty high-level White House employee. She was a high-level advisor to the president. And the Office of Special Counsel has come out uh, in the recent past with, I believe, actually two, at least two separate reports um, talking about Kellyanne and her activities and describing her as essentially a pretty serial Hatch Act violator. Um, now, what was it that she was doing that was of so much concern to the Office of Special Counsel and that they, that they believed uh, constituted Hatch Act violations? 
she uh, repeatedly gave television interviews and in some cases put up social media posts in which she talked about Democratic candidates for office. Um, in some instances, she was talking about uh, Democratic uh, presidential primary candidates while the primaries were going on. Um, in some instances, she was talking about um, Democratic candidates for Senate. And she was making statements in these interviews and in social media posts denigrating them. Um, you know, saying really negative things about them, essentially opposing them. Um, and what the Office of Special Counsel said was, when she did this, she was doing it in her capacity as a White House employee, as a federal employee. So um, it's, it's a good case study because it helps us to understand that even if she was not at work at that particular moment, um, she was not taking enough steps uh, to separate her speech from her official capacity in the federal government. So she was interviewing and speaking as a White House employee, or she was tweeting from an official account. Um, and, and the other nice thing this illustrates is that it can be very important to pay attention to social media. Social media counts here. Um, use of an official you know, federal government associated account can certainly trigger Hatch Act concerns. Um, so that is one of our examples of the ways in which an employee can, can trigger some worries here under the Hatch Act. Here's another example that happened relatively recently over the summer. Uh, many of you may also recognize this picture that was taken um, during the Republican National Convention over the summer. And as many of you may remember, some significant chunk of that convention took place on the White House lawn. Um, and so one of the interesting things to note is that the vice president and the president are both ex explicitly exempted from the Hatch Act. Uh, so you see there President Trump, he is not violating the Hatch Act by engaging in political activity while um, on federal property and acting in his federal capacity. But um, there were, with pretty much absolute certainty, plenty of federal employees um, who work at the White House who participated in a whole number of ways in making this event happen and making it run. And you know, there was a lot of discussion after this took place and, and as it was coming up um, about the fact that for all of those employees who are not exempted from the Hatch Act, working on this is certainly engaging in political activity because this was, you know, this was a, absolutely um, a political event. And so this was seen by many as sort of a, you know, a, wide-ranging um, massive Hatch Act violation that occurred. Um, last example I wanted to share with you, and, and I think it's, you know, it's hopefully useful because it actually showcases in some ways how, uh, specifically how scientists have sometimes gotten caught up in this unintentionally. This is going back a ways. This was in 2004 during the presidential campaign that happened in that year. And as I'm sure you all remember, John Kerry was the presidential uh, nominee for the Democratic Party in 2004. And during that campaign period, he visited the Kennedy Space Center, NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And there were sort of a series of events. He, I, my understanding is there was a little bit of a, a rally at the visitor center and he also um, suited up in this pretty amazing suit um, and toured one of the facilities and uh, along with a few others and a bunch of photos were taken of the event as he went along and as he did his tour and as well as a good bit of merriment on the internet about the way John Kerry looked in his NASA suit um, that he had to wear for the tour, um, there, there was a whole kerfuffle because NASA posted pictures um, of various parts of this visit on its website. 
or on one of its websites. And there was a there was great concern that you know, wait a minute, is uh, you know, are we then are the federal employees, the NASA employees, and and likely some scientists who were involved in this, and who put up those pictures. Um, taking some action that was to, you know, to support this partisan political candidate for office. And there was a great deal of concern that it was a Hatch Act violation. Um, and so the pictures were taken down and then there was more discussion and some of them were put back up. And one of the things that it illustrates nicely is that it can sometimes be very difficult to, to tell uh, for sure where the lines are. So, for example, the, the language in the statute and the way it's been interpreted uh, focuses on activity that's taking place in a federal building. Um, some of this activity was outside of a federal building. And so there was, there was a, you know, but on, on, you know, on grounds, on land that's owned by the federal government. And so there was a question of, does that you know does that cross into hatch act territory um that's the kind of question that can also come up for example if you were in a national park um which is not a building at least for them you know in, in large part but um but is federal property so it illustrates how there can be gray areas and how you know how this stuff can be can be complicated to navigate um even though even for those who are who are doing their best to stay on the right side of the lines so that is an, a, a general overview of how the Hatch Act works and how it, it may apply to scientists, who, particularly those who are federal employees. Um, the other important topic that I wanted to talk about was how do First Amendment considerations play into this when a scientist is considering making some kind of um, political speech in some form or another around an election. Um, and so it, just as with, the, as with the Hatch Act, there is there's a huge amount here. The First Amendment is a really rich <laughs> area of law. There's a huge amount of case law and a huge amount of writing. Uh, and there are a lot of nuances that we, we won't be able um, to, to dive into. There's a lot more that could be said. But um, the general rule of thumb is that if you are a government employee, your speech is going to be protected by the First Amendment under the following circumstances. It will be protected if you are speaking as a private citizen and if you are speaking about a matter of public concern and if it doesn't interfere with your job. And there are some really important exceptions to that and to cover a couple of them very quickly, um, one thing to be aware of is that if you are considered a high level employee, and again, if somebody has a specific question about that, you know, that's the kind of thing we're very happy to help you work through. Um, but for those who are considered high level employees, your speech may not be protected by the First Amendment, even under uh, those circumstances. Um, and another really important exception for everyone to remember is that the First Amendment does not protect you in the instance where what you are revealing is classified information. Um, so for any scientists, and, and there are quite a number who do from time to time work with classified information, um, in all of these circumstances, it is of course really important to make sure that you are aware of the rules that govern that and make sure that you're following them carefully. So I wanted to, to move into covering a couple of just sort of most frequently asked questions that come out of all of this for the scientists that we talk to and work with um, and that we've heard from. Um, the, the first one I wanted to talk about, and, and I touched on this a little bit before, is um, can I make a political donation? or contribution and what, you know, what do I need to be aware of around that? 
And the answer there is, generally speaking, absolutely yes, you can donate to a political candidate or party or a group, a partisan one, um, if you want to, as long as you're doing it out of your personal funds. A couple of things to be aware of, and 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 this applies particularly um, for uh, those who um, might. I, we'll talk a little bit later about um, you know those who are might happen not to be U.S. citizens not being able to make political donations. That's one important exception here. Um, so to the extent there are any restrictions, um, one thing that is really important to keep in mind is that. A, a political donation or contribution can take a whole bunch of different forms. Um, it can be your really standard, you know, I donated a, a bit of money to a candidate's campaign, but it can also be um, a donation of goods and services that you've provided either for free or at a reduced cost. It can be um, paying money to attend an event a fundraiser, it can be buying merchandise from the campaign's website, all of those constitute political donations. Um, the other really important thing to mention um, is, you know, I, so I said at the outset that, that you absolutely can, you know, generally speaking, do this as long as you're doing it out of your personal funds. Um, that sometimes can get a bit complicated, um, particularly for those who, uh, those scientists who um, are not employed by the federal government but receive, in at least to some extent, federal grant funding. Um, so, so the important rule of thumb is that generally speaking, federal money that a scientist has received as personal funds, as personal salary, um, and, and, and received into their personal bank account is going to be considered personal funds. It has lost at that point its identity as federal funds and it's your personal funding to use as you wish. When it comes to grants, um, I, I know from talking with some of the scientists who's come, who have come to us that in many circumstances a grant um, breaks out a certain part uh, of the money that's being awarded as, and earmarks it as salary for the scientists. And, and there it works the same way. So that money that's been marked as salary once it's received by you into your bank account, it is no longer uh, federal money. It is your personal funds to do with as you wish. Um, uh, grant funds um, that aren't earmarked that way, that are intended for some other purpose under the grant, of course, it's important to make sure that those funds are used for their intended purpose under the grant and not um, not for, for these kinds of activities. And that goes too for um, resources that are acquired with those funds. So, you know, if, if part of the grant funding was to buy a new laptop, um, a new printer. It's important to make sure that those resources are used for their intended purpose under the grant and not for these um, personal political activities. Um, so the next question that I have heard a bunch and wanted to spend a minute talking about is, um, can I participate in a political campaign? And we talked about this um, a bit earlier on. Generally speaking, the answer is if you are a less restricted employee, you have pretty broad ability to get involved with and participate in a campaign. So those employees can, on their own time, volunteer uh, for a campaign or a political group or party by canvassing, driving voters to the polls, being a poll worker. They can display signs, buttons, stickers supporting or opposing a partisan candidate as long as they are not doing that at work. Um, they can circulate nominating petitions for a candidate, again, not at work. Um, they can publicly endorse or oppose a candidate. You can speak on behalf of a candidate at a rally. You can take an active part in, in volunteering and um, working with a campaign, all as long as you're making sure that you're doing that on your own time and in your personal capacity. Um, how about expressing political opinions in public? Um, so again, the Hatch Act does not prevent less restricted federal employees from doing that as long as they are not on the job 
when they do it. So as long as you are not on duty in a federal building or a federal vehicle, um, for whatever reason, the act seems particularly concerned with um, with activities that take place in federal vehicles. So it's important to keep that in mind. And it's important to keep in mind that that counts ev if, even if you are not on duty, technically, when you are in that federal building or vehicle, um, or in some other way exercising your federal authority. As long as you are not doing those things, then you are free to express whatever political opinion you wish to publicly if you are a less restricted employee. And again, as we touched on a little bit earlier, this this applies to online places, spaces like social media accounts and and blogs. Um, you are free to express your your political opinions in those spaces as long as you are not doing it um, at a time when you are on duty exercising federal authority or in a federal building or vehicle. Um, it's note here that further restricted employees are subject to some additional limitations here, especially when it comes to um, online uh, posting links that have been generated by um, by partisan political campaigns or groups. So there, there's a little bit of nuance there. And if you're a further restricted employee, it's, it's definitely important to make sure that you've understood all the contours there. Um, but generally speaking for less restricted employees, and those are the guidelines. So as we have been in this pandemic uh, since March, uh, I, you know, I've been mentioning a lot, make sure you're not doing this while you are on duty, while you are on the job. And obviously COVID has meant and probably will continue to mean for some time that for many of us, um, we are on duty while we are at home much more frequently than we used to be. Um, there's been, you know, there's been a real blurring of lines. A lot of us are working from home a lot more um, than we used to. And so how does that play in here? What does, you know, what does on the job mean in that in that context? How do I know when I am and I'm not on the job when I am and I'm not free to engage in this activity? Um, so the, the general rule of thumb here is that you are generally considered on duty while you are teleworking or performing official duties, even if you are at home. Um, so it's important to try to keep those lines as clear as possible, even though I know that that is challenging in these times, but keeping track of when you are teleworking, when you are not, when you are performing your official work duties, when you are not, and making sure that you're not engaging in partisan political activities while you are, uh, while you are even if you are at home. I'm going to move through this one just because we're running a little short of time and I wanted to just get to a couple of final basic tips and best practices um, to leave us some time, a little bit of time for questions. Um, so these are just, you know, general um, best pieces of advice that, that hopefully are useful for all scientists, whether you are a federal employee or a university employee or an employee of a private, you know, a, a private institution of some other kind. Um, number one is generally you cannot go wrong making sure that you use your own funds and resources to engage in political activity and that you're doing it on your own time. Um, I think I probably said that about a hundred times. It's probably the most important takeaway and thing to keep in mind. And it's incredibly helpful to take steps to um, maintain a clear separation between your personal and professional. And um, so to the extent that you can, keeping good records of your working hours so that you know when you were on duty, when you were not, um, making sure to keep nice, clear separation to the extent possible between your personal and professional email and social media accounts and trying to use your work email and, and social media only for work and vice versa. Um, same with any kind of government equipment. Um, and it can be really helpful when you do want to, to um, make political statements or engage in advocacy to try to make sure that you're 
you're careful to make clear that you are speaking in your personal capacity and use disclaimers to help uh, help ensure that it's clear that you are not speaking on behalf of your employer. And it's always a good idea, despite these basic guidelines, to just take some time to make sure you've understood your particular institution's policies around political speech. They probably have them. Um, and taking a minute to make sure you're aware of them. Um, last but not least, a few tips on what to do if um, you do somehow find yourself um, being targeted in some way because of political activity that you have engaged in. And um, the first thing that I want to say there is to remember that institutional counsel, the, the lawyers for the agency you're employed, employed by or university counsel, whatever it might be, can be a really useful resource, but it's crucial to remember that they represent the institution and not you. And they are not your lawyers and sometimes your interests and the interests of the institution will diverge. Um, if the retaliation or targeting that you're experiencing is coming from inside your organization, um, it, it's really important and very helpful to take some time to understand what internal channels are available to you for filing a complaint, for otherwise responding, and what the implications of using them are. And again, CSLDF is here as a resource for anyone who has those kinds of questions. Um, if the targeting is coming from outside your institution, um, the first thing to say is that although it's not always what people want to hear, sometimes the best thing to do is to ignore um, certain kinds of, of hostile or harassing messages. That said, um, if what you've received is a congressional inquiry or a subpoena, a records request, and certainly if it is actually a threatening message, a physically threatening message, that is a list of things that should never be ignored. It's important to deal with them immediately. And please do contact CSLDF or another lawyer immediately. Um, last but not least, I wanted to just take a moment to mention that a lot of what I have been discussing is also contained in some written resources that we've developed for scientists. And I have a couple examples of them up here. They are all available on our website. We have some great handbooks for engaging in political activity and, and responding to uh, harassment or intimidation and things like that. So please do feel free to hop onto our website and check them out. They're there for download. And this is my contact information here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If you have an individual question or a question you remember later, and I will, I will call it there and be very glad to take some questions if we have any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so much information. So um, I, I'm curious, uh, we focused a lot on federal laws. Um, are there also similar state laws that um, that scientists, especially those who might be state employees because they're faculty at a, a state university, a public university, for example, might need to be aware of? You know, the, so in terms of the Hatch Act and the way it regulates the political activity of federal employees, I am not aware off the top of my head of any state law equivalents. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. <laughs> and and it's a great question. And and again, something that I'd be very, you know, I'd be very happy to, to you know, any particular individual scientist check out what's going on in their state if they are a state government employee. In terms of the First Amendment, um, which we touched on a bit, so there the answer is absolutely yes, all of that does apply. Um, if you are a state government employee, just as if you are a federal government employee and, or a local government employee, um, you know, perhaps a scientist who works for, uh, you know, a city government agency or lab, um, anything like that. So anybody who's, uh, who's a government employee at those levels as well um, is 
the First Amendment does apply in those situations and could, you know, if those sort of, you know, basic checkpoints um, that we talked through were met, uh, apply to protect a scientist's speech under those circumstances. Thanks. Thanks. Um, we had a, a question come in asking about the what are the potential ramifications of a government science advisor? Uh, the example given was Dr. Fauci uh, being identified, whether accurate or not, as a member of a political party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So one one of the things that the Hatch Act makes very abundantly clear is that it does not in any way um, affect the ability of a U.S. citizen to register with a particular political party um, just because they are a federal employee. So, the, you know, the example of Dr. Fauci, the fact that he might be identified as associated with a particular political party, that is absolutely fine. He is fully entitled to do that, as is every other federal employee. And the fact that someone has that status doesn't, you know, does not does not in any way limit them from doing that. Unfortunately, it it has had some, uh, you know, as, as we've seen uh, with the example of Dr. Fauci, it, it hasn't necessarily um, meant that he hasn't experienced some ramifications, not necessarily Hatch Act related, but uh, there have been a lot of, um, there's been a good deal of reporting about how he's been prevented from um, speaking on a variety of shows, communicating with the public in a variety of ways. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a, a good and unfortunate example of how, you know, the, the technical legalities can differ from real world experiences in, in some ways. Thanks. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come up. So your, your presentation was exhaustive, I guess, <laughs> um, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, giving us this send off for the next few weeks here in the United States specifically, and um, but also the the understanding that um, it, it it there isn't a, a specific limitation on kinds of political activity, um, and that that's something that is is protected within limits. Um, so thank you so much. Very happy to do it. Thank you so much, everybody. Well, I also want to thank, since this is the end of our conference, um, thank on behalf of the AAAS Science and Human Rights Coalition, all the member organizations that are a member of the co members of the coalition. I want to thank you, the participants. Uh, you've been amazing, engaging with all the speakers and um, and and really taking on in a serious way the some of these challenging questions that uh, 2020 has thrown at us and that uh, going back much further than 2020 that we are reckoning with now. Uh, I especially want to thank the presenters in every one of the sessions and workshops and everyone who gave their time to be part of an Ask Me Anything session, one of the informal sessions. Um, it's It really means a lot for everyone to be in this space right now. Uh, the session organizers who actually thought of a lot of these ideas for topics back in March and April when we had the call for proposals and for then following through and making this happen today um, in spite of 2020. I, we're so grateful for that. Um, I wanna thank the host committee who uh, did a lot of work to help make this conference a success uh, and the transition from a live conference, which we usually have to our uh, virtual conference here. 
I want to thank AVEX, our partner for, um, for that visual, virtual conference. Uh, this has been a learning experience for all of us, and we're really grateful for all the support you gave to, to make this happen. Uh, thank you to the AAAS staff who have been amazing through the, all the preparations and as we've been uh, trying to make sure that we continue to have that space that the coalition is known for, for um, the, a comfortable place to tackle uncomfortable questions. Uh, and also, I want to make sure to thank the Andrew M. Sessler Fund for Science, Education, and Human Rights, and all of the generous donors who support the coalition's activities, including this conference. Thank you for joining us in this incredibly difficult year in our mission to bridge science, technology, and human rights, which as one of the opening speakers said in the first session yesterday, uh, science and human rights is in many ways the answer to 2020. Best wishes to you all, stay safe and healthy.